Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Doug Albertson. I have the honor of working at this church, as well as the pleasure of introducing the news of the day and welcoming you to our church life this morning. If you can stay after church, we hope you will. We always have fellowship time down in our social hall, which is to the right as you leave our sanctuary. Uh, fresh donuts, great coffee, and wonderful people. Hopefully you'll spend a few minutes down there with us. We consider it part of our worship life together, social time. So come on by and see us after church this morning. And of course, we try to remind folks that if you're on the center aisle, would you find those red pew pads and sign in and let us know you're here and pass them down to your neighbor. We appreciate that. If you're new or visiting this morning to our community, we're especially glad to have you here. And thank you for being with us. And if you uh, recently settled into our town and uh, are signing in for the first time, let us know where you are and we'll bring you a present this afternoon. We have little welcome bags. We're like the welcome community around here. So let us know if you're here and we'll send out something to thank you for coming this morning. Uh, in the course of the weeks ahead, we always try to let you know what's going on. Hopefully, maybe you've seen some of that through the slides that are overhead. Uh, reading your bulletin. There's something in the bulletin this morning that there's something in the church's life today that's not in the bulletin this morning, and that is our birthday celebration for a woman who we love so much named Doris Evans. It's been in the Roseleaf. We've talked about it. Doris's 90th birthday party is this afternoon here at church. All are welcomed. Come on by. If you, even if you can only stop for a second and give her a hug, it would mean a lot. Starts at 3 o'clock in Fellowship Hall today. We'd love to have you there. We have a few speeches to give, and I think there's a silly song that was written in her behalf because, you know, she was one of ours. We love Doris Evans. Her 90th birthday is today. You might also notice in the bulletin there's a couple opportunities that are coming up. I love this one. It says in the outreach box, it says, help out harvesting vegetables. No experience needed. <laughs> so I talked to Diane Jorgensen, who's involved with the community garden out at Stony Point this morning. She said, well, it'd be good to know if the fruit's ripe or not. I fair, that's vegetables are ripe. I suppose that's probably a fair requirement. Um, if, you can, if you have a time, it's a lovely garden. It's really richly growing right now. If you haven't been out to see it for a while, do so. Uh, today after uh, church at 12.30 is the movie from Reconciling Ministries. You might have seen that. We've been talking about it a little bit. It's going to be at 12.30. Matter of fact, there's an idea. You could go out and do, no, don't go do the harvesting garden thing until you call Paul O'Rear. I get ahead of myself. But hey, you could go out to Stony Point this afternoon for the movie. It starts at 12.30 or come up Tuesday night and join us uh, for Spirit Cafe, 5.30 dinner, 6 o'clock worship, and then after worship, we'll show the movie again at 7.15. Those details are in there. Hopefully you've seen that and can take time to participate in some of those things that are going on in the life of the church. That's about all I have to bring to your attention, but don't forget it's Vacation Bible School in a week. We're looking pretty good. Elizabeth was actually smiling the other day, first time I've seen that in a month. So we're happy for Elizabeth Walton, the director of our children's ministry. I think she's getting pretty close. There she is right there. Are you smiling? Oh, very much so. I thought so. <laughs> it's good to have you uh, smiling, and I know it's a big week coming up for you. It starts a week from Tuesday. This next week, say a, a blessing and give a prayer to our pastors as they gather for their annual charge conference, the church conference. Uh, they'll be, they meet once a year to get together uh, to learn and do legislation, uh, to, ordin to do ordination of new folks, but as I like to say, just to check in with one another and ask, ask them the Wesleyan question, how is it with your soul? So see uh, Pastor Blake and Lindsay in the next couple days and give them your blessings as they head to Burlingame or something this year. It's not Sacramento. They're going someplace else. But anyway, we think about them as they travel. So let's take a moment, shall we, and stand and say hello to one another or reach across the aisle and give a handshake.
Oh, gracious God, we do indeed lift our voices to you with an hallelujah. It is so good to be together at this time and to share in this community, to be into this sacred space and to have time to worship you and to praise you and to hear your word and to, to, un, to lift our souls and have, unleash our thoughts and let us be in a place where we can hear you and that we can share with you our words. We give thanks for all that you have been blessed with and ask you to be with us now in this week ahead. Amen. And speaking of praise, we're going to ask Elizabeth Walton to come forward. And I believe she wants to invite some others. The children's to come forward. We'll start there. I think it's more coming too. So today is a day of great gratitude and appreciation. Today is the day we say thank you to our Sunday school teachers. We have three teachers that have been completely committed this year and actually for the past decade or so that have been working with our children, building their faith, showing God's love, and just being special friends to our to the children that have come through this church. So today, uh, unfortunately, two of those three were unable to be here. So we are asking Miss Lynn Garrison, who is our teacher extraordinaire. She comes faithfully almost every week to guide these children to share their love and just to be an amazing person. So we have a poem that Miss Kira is going to read. When God created teachers, he gave us special friends to help us understand his world and truly comprehend the beauty and the wonder of everything we see and become a better person with each discovery. When God created teachers, he gave us special guides to show us ways in which to grow so we can all decide how to live and how to do what's right instead of wrong to lead us so that we can lead and learn how to be strong. Why God created teachers in his wisdom and his grace was to help us learn to make our world a better, wiser place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask Pastor Blake to play a, pray a blessing over the teachers, over the children of the church, and then we'll head off to Sunday school. Let's share together. Gracious God, we give thanks to you for, first of all, for all the children that are in our midst here and also over at Stony Point. We're grateful for their life, their faith, their families, the way they are growing uh, in you, becoming more like Jesus in their lives. We thank you for their witness to us and all that they mean and inspire us to be and to do. We thank you for those like Lynn who teach them and who guide them and who share with them the love of Christ. We ask you to continue to bless these teachers and Encourage them and inspire them in ways that uh, will enable them to communicate your great love for them. And we pray that, Lord, we as a congregation can continue to, to expand our, our love and support of, of all of our children and all of our, those who work with them here in this church. It's such a privilege to be the body of Christ together. We thank you and praise you. Bless these teachers especially in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Stand by that. Our appreciation. <laughs>
walk in Jerusalem just like John. My feet stand steady, oh, my feet stand steady, my feet stand steady. To walk in Jerusalem just like John. from James, chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, the New Revised Standard Version, titled, Faith Without Works is Dead. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So we remain seated as we sing our song of response. Let us plead for faith alone. <laughs>
wanted to point out again this morning that, uh, as we explained last week, that a uh, couple of things in your bulletin. Um, you'll notice uh, that the insert does, as always, uh, list the whole caring corner, and they have a prayer card in there, so I'd refer you to that. But we realized, you know, that not everybody knows that in the caring corner, the most recent additions are always at the bottom. And so we've kind of pulled that out in the inside of your order of service where it says caring corner on the right side. We've kind of pulled out the most recent additions to help to give them some, you know, greater uh, also focus that we might draw those to your attention especially. So we commend again the caring corner to you, the most recent additions, and also the full list uh, to your prayer uh, during the week. Also on that side, you, on the other side of the caring corner, you'll see a, a, a prayer uh, response uh, we introduced this last week. It's here this week to be in prayer for our church and for yourself and for one another. Here's a guide to do that during this week. As always, use the bottom of that to submit other prayer concerns uh, for the week. We'd be glad to receive those. Also, you'll notice in the order of service uh, in the inside, there are the uh, order of worships for all of our English language services. So you can take note of that. And on the back is where all the announcements are. In the middle of it also, we've inserted the weekly devotional guide. If you're looking for where, so if you take notes during the message, uh, the notes will now be on the back of the devotional guide. So that's where you find those, if that's something that you would like to, like to do. Loving God, we thank you for your word that gives us life. We pray that as we reflect on your word this morning, that it might come alive for us, and that we might meet you through the proclamation of your word, the reflection of it, and in our conversations together. Be in our midst. Speak to each of our hearts what it is that we each need to hear from you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite Bible passages uh, reminds me of why Jesus came. What's the purpose of faith? Why we are involved in this endeavor as a church together? It comes from John 10, verse 10. Jesus said, I, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. <laughs> Abundant life. Uh, whenever I find myself getting maybe off track or making faith more or less than it is, I'm reminded that what it's really all about is living life to the full. That's what it's always about. It's about living freely and fully now, uh, yes, and certainly forevermore. But even now, in the midst of this life, Jesus came to, to set us free to live and to live fully, to live, you know, technicolor life, you know, life in HD, you know, and just everything to come sharper and clearer into focus. And so all that we've been talking about together, and especially through this series that we've been doing on three commitments and six practices, is really about uh, living more into this abundant life that Jesus has given us. Uh, last week, we inserted these there in your, again uh, in your bulletin today as a summary of this series that we've been about this past couple of months. And, and for me, this series has a couple of different, you know, I want to explain again, a couple of different uh, areas of focus. One is for us to remind us how we grow in this abundant life, how we stay on the journey of this abundant life, how we understand what it is, what commitments we make, and, and what practices we do to help us on that path, right? God has reached to out us in grace, and we respond uh, in faith to God. So part of it is, is understanding how it is we as a church, we as a body of Christ together, follow Christ. We do so by committing ourselves to him to belong to him, to become like him, and to be with him in the world. We do so by living out those commitments in the six practices on the middle here. We, we live into it that way. But it's all about this kind of growing in the abundant life that God has given us. But there's another kind of focus for me about, about this, and it has to do with how we as Christian people share with, with others outside of the church with whom we do have a connection with, a very important connection. We at least have these two connections with people who are, who are outside of, of, our, of our community. I think we have the connection that, that they, along with we, are, are, are searching and seeking a full life, an abundant life, life to its fullest. That's a common human desire and search. I think we're also seeking to, to change the world where it's not quite right. Every human being, when they see someone or something that's not right in the world, you know, you have an urge, a desire, like it's an instinct to want to change it or make a difference uh, in, that, in that area. I think it's because we're created in God's image, 
And so if something is, is being done or is happening that really is outside of God's love and care and right and justice, we, we kind of have a sense of this, this needs to be different. And that, that image gets distorted, yes, but it's still there, I think, and it, and, it, and it often stirs within every human being to want to live a more full life, life to its fullest, and also to want to make a difference in the world, to want to leave the world better than when we <laughs> entered it in this life. Like, that's a common connection we have. The problem we have, though, is when we connect with people in that way, what we often do is we invite them to come to church. And more and more, that just doesn't make sense to people. They don't understand the church. People outside the church, if they want to have more of an abundant life and they want to make a difference in the world, they don't understand how the church helps them do that. You you understand me? (laughs) They don't get the connection. So it's not enough for us to say, you know, come to church. and We can't assume that they know what that means. What it means to be a part of the church is to be on this journey with them and with us of seeking a more abundant life and of making a difference in our world. As a church, we, we believe Jesus is central to that. We believe Jesus is the one who can help us find that abundant life and help us change the world. And therefore, in the church, we, we make a commitment to Jesus to belong to him, to become like him, and to be with him in the world. That's the way we understand accessing the abundant life God has. That's the way we understand as we practice those commitments and these practices, that's the way we understand how we grow in that. So for us, Jesus is central to that endeavor. And that's how we can explain to people that's what we're about, you know. We're about that same search you're about, abundant life, making the world different. Here's how we do that here. Here's how we do that together. When you come among us, that's what you come among. You're not coming among us to be a, you know, a religious person. You're not coming among us to be you know, an institutional Christian. You're coming among us to be uh, on this journey of, of finding an abundant life and this journey of, of making a difference in the world. With Jesus, we believe, at the center of that task and endeavor. That helps people figure out what it is that this is about and to actually consider whether or not that is something which they feel called to, they feel moved to as well. In Christ, God actually is offering God's very life to us. God's saying in Jesus, come share my life, both now and forever. That's the abundant life that we seek and that we're, and that we are uh, about. So this has those two focuses for me, both internally to help us stay focused on what it means for us to be a disciple of Jesus, for us to follow Jesus, for us to um, share in, uh, in Jesus. Um, and then it also helps us communicate to others what we're about. You know? If people knew that, I think they would really start <laughs> flocking to this movement if they understood that, because that's what they're about. In their own heart of hearts, they just can't connect those connections. Now, to um, thoroughly confuse you, no, that's not my reason, I want, to add three, I want to add three rules. And I want to do this. They're not new rules. They're rules that we've talked about before, rules you probably already know, because it's really important now to lay these rules over these commitments and practices, because if we don't, we can get really messed up, right? I'll, I'll, I'll explain how. We can get really off track if we don't lay these three rules over these practices. You probably know the rules. They're Wesleyan rules. They're actually actually the great commandment. Jesus said the great commandment is to love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, Wesley and and, and, and the updated version from Bishop Reuben Job is is taking love your neighbor and making it into two rules and keeping the one rule, love God. Three rules are do no harm, do good. That's how you love your neighbor. You do no harm to them, (laughs) and you do good to them. And then stay in love with God. Now, those three rules are really important to lay over these practices and commitments. And I want to share a little bit about that today. Here's the takeaway. Okay? So those of you who like to kind of come in and out of the sermon, come to me right now. (laughs) Then go away in a minute. This is the takeaway. (laughs) Yeah, I know how it is. Come on. you know. I see your eyes. 
Don't confuse practices, these six, with rules. That's the great danger. To, confu- to make these practices rules. But rule simply is love God, love your neighbor. Do no harm, do good. Lo- don't. That's the rule. That's, that's the rule. Jesus built, boiled it down to that. If you make these rules, we get into a lot of trouble. Right? Here's some of the trouble we get into. We get in trouble like, you know, uh, if I'm not following all, if I see these, uh, you know, these six things, these six practices as rules, and I don't follow them as well as I want to, well, I start feeling, you know, guilty and ashamed and low about myself. Worse, if I do do them to some, with some regularity, with some discipline, I may start to feel, hmm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty spiritual. Look at me, I'm a spiritual person. And I might look at somebody else who's not doing them well enough or not doing them at all outside the church and think, I'm better than you. Now, I may not say that, but that's what's in my heart. It's like, I am, look at me, I'm a religious person, I'm a spiritual person, and what's wrong with you? Know, what's, wrong with, what's wrong with you? So I may, start, I may start judging or condemning other people who are not doing the rules, because they're not, but they're not rules. That, that's the thing about them. And when, and when you, or when I in my heart feel like I am really spiritual <laughs> because I'm doing all these things, it, it, it communicates whether I say it, to, I say it or not. Others may feel that, I, that I'm superior to them, right? They, they'll, they'll pick up on it. If I feel I'm superior because I'm doing all these religious things, they'll pick up on it whether I say it or not. And there's a, there's a bit of a stench to that, to be honest with you. <laughs> there really is, right? That, that's why sometimes people outside the church are, are sometimes so put off. And they get so angry sometimes and so negative about, about the church or about people in the church because they feel like the, 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 that, that odor, you know, is, comes off. Because we make these things, you know, these are, you know, these are, we make these things rules. They're not. They're means of grace. There are ways to, to, to grow. There, there are ways to experience life more fully. And the more I engage in these six practices, the more I feel life to the fullest. And it's, a, it's an opportunity. And when I don't, I just miss an opportunity. It's not like I've, you know, gravely sinned or something. It's just like I, they're, opportun- they're means, they're, they're chances to, 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 to be more loving, uh, to be more full of joy, to be more thankful I mean, that's, that's the opportunity I have through these practices is to, is to nurture that kind of a growing spirit in me. They're means of grace. The rule is do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. This is a means of, of, of entering life more fully. You see? That's the, that's the important part of, of how the, the practices need not to be rules. Now, this is really important because throughout the... Uh, history of Christianity uh, and, and the church. Christians or churches in different times, some of us, in following these practices as rules, we have done harm to others. We have not done good to them. Amen. Times in history, you know, some people have felt shunned by the church because they weren't, we made these rules. You're not doing these? You know, you're less... In worst case scenarios, they've been outright persecuted. <laughs> right? There are times in the history of humanity in which people, in, in being religious, have done harm and have not done good. That's why that's the rule. If, if in practicing these things, I, it doesn't lead to, to doing less harm and doesn't lead to doing good, then I've missed the mark of the practice. Right? I've missed it. That's why Jesus said, love God, love neighbor. If, if you, whatever you're doing, you know, if you're becoming more religious but you're not loving God more and not loving your neighbor as yourself, you've missed the whole point of the practice. This is not about becoming more religious. It's about becoming more human. It's about becoming more alive. It's about growing closer to the kind of life that Jesus calls us to. So that's why we want to overlay these three simple rules over over this, because we don't want to turn this into another works righteousness. We don't want to turn it into a religion. This is a, these are means of grace. These are ways of relating to God and to one another that are really important. 
Now, Pastor Lindsay is this week over at Stony Point, and she is uh, giving a message on the first simple rule, do no harm. Uh, we'll switch next week. She'll come over here and do do no harm here, and, and I'll do what I'm doing today, do good here, and then we'll do that over at Stony Point. So we'll kind of share this the last couple of weeks, this first two, these two rules. But that's the takeaway. Don't turn practices into rules. They are not. They're means of grace. The rule to do good sounds simple enough. Do good. In fact, uh, in some ways, we don't, you, you say, why do we need any of this? Just do good, do no harm, and stay in love with God. Forget all that. <laughs> and I would say, you're right. We don't need any of that. Just do no harm and do good and stay in love with God, and you'll do everything. But that's what Jesus said. He said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor and yourself, and you don't need the whole law. Just, there's a problem, but what, I'll get to that in a minute. Let's talk about what it means to do good. I'm going to come back to how that helps us, <laughs> why we need it, <laughs> why not just follow the rules. In the book of James, you heard Teddy read about faith without works is dead. I want to say something real quick about the relation between faith and works, faith and good works. Because when James says this, it sounds like it contradicts Paul, in other parts of the New Testament, where Paul says, you know, we're saved, by, uh, we're saved by grace through faith. We're saved by faith alone. And he really, has a, he really goes through a, a, quite an extensive argument in several books of the New Testament to try to, to say that we're not saved by our works. It's not about doing enough works and God saves you. We're saved by faith alone. God's grace is a gift to us, and God saves us as a gift, and, and, and our response to that grace is faith. And our response to that faith so that grace is faith, which is expressed in committing ourselves to Christ. Free commitment. You follow me? So they seem contradictory. James says, faith without works is dead. And Paul says, you know, you don't need works to be saved. But they're not really contradictory at all. They, they, they kind of really are talking about this in, in complementary ways. When people discover Paul's insight about faith, they are changed. And they often change the world by it. St. Augustine discovered Paul's insight about faith and, and faith as a gift and saved by faith, you know, through grace. And the Western world really has still been shaped by that great transformation in Augustine's life and how that worked itself out. Martin Luther discovered in the book of Romans uh, Paul's insight on faith. And, 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 and a renewal movement in the church called the Protestant Reformation was born. John Wesley had his heart strangely warmed when he rediscovered Paul's emphasis upon faith as a gift. And the whole Methodist movement is, is a part of that expression. So whenever anybody rediscovers Paul's insight about faith, often the world is transformed as well as people's lives. But apparently, Paul's insight about faith was also uh, lend itself to misunderstanding, where there were some people who thought, you know, I don't need to do any, any good in the world. I just need to have faith. And that would be incomprehensible to Paul, because Paul said in Galatians, you know, uh, faith works itself out through love. So faith working through love. He had a connection. When you had faith, you worked it out. But some abused that by saying, I just need to have faith, which they meant intellectual assent. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, the Son of God. I don't have to do anything about it. So James comes along and says, faith without works is dead. <laughs> faith is a loving response to God. Love always seeks expression. You can't have faith and not do good work. They're inseparable. Love seeks expression. Faith seeks expression. So faith and works, they go together. You don't, you don't work to have faith, but faith works itself out <laughs> in love uh, in the world. Even in Ephesians, Paul says, you know, we were created. God created us in Christ for good works. That's why we're made, why we're created, to do, to do good. So you know that uh, you're, you're getting it right in your life with God if, if you find the fruit of your life more and more is about doing good to others and doing good in the world. That's the fruit of a life of faith. So simple, just do good, right? Just go do it. Amen, go do good. <laughs> Problem is, is that we often don't do good. 
I may start a morning out, you know, with my devotion, and, and, uh, and sitting here, I read some scripture, and I pray, oh God, uh, uh, I'm going to do good today. <laughs> Show me ways I can do good today. I'm going to invest myself, and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to give myself to you. I, I just want to do, show me somebody that I can do good towards. Show me ways I can get, I want, I'm going to do good today. And then, you know, you get out there, and then, and then someone cuts you off on the road, and you don't do good to them. <laughs> Oops. You know, the finger you show them, or the thing you're yelling in the car about them, or the horn you're honking, you're not doing good to them. I'm not doing good to them. I intended to, I set my mind to it, I prayed about it, I started the day on the right foot, but something happened, I reacted. And I did not do good, literally. <laughs> Happens a lot, unfortunately. <laughs> you get along with all your relatives? You know, you ever, you ever, you ever know you're going to be with a relative that you just really have a, might be a brother or sister, even. <laughs> You just might be a parent child. You just, you, just, you just lock horns all the time. There are just certain things that, that that person can say or do that can just send you off, and you just you set your mind straight. Before, you get, before the holiday, you're getting together. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take the bait. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to say a harmful thing. I'm going to do no harm. I'm going to do good. I'm gonna, and what happens? <laughs> you know, you intended to. You gave yourself a pep talk, <laughs> and it just didn't happen. That happens all the time. It happens every single day. It's simple. Just do good. But it is quite a challenge. How often do you do good to someone that does not do good to you? When, when the rule is to do good. Then say to the people who do good to you, it says do good to everyone. In fact, uh, you know, Jesus said, even love your enemies and do good to your enemies. How, do you, how often do you do good to someone who doesn't do good to you? That's hard. I don't even want to do that. <laughs> but the rule is to do, so it's simple, do good. But it is very, very challenging, even in the best of circumstances. There's a quote that's attributed to John Wesley that, um, that it, it's actually some scholarly debate whether Wesley actually said it. It's always attributed to him. He could have said it. Let's go that far. It sounds like him. He says, do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can in all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as you ever can. <laughs> it's universal, the rule. Do good. Do good. The reason why I need these commitments and practices is that I might expand my capacity to do good. In order to do that rule, I've got to become a, a better person. I've got to become more like Jesus. I've got to grow. I have to mature. I don't have the capacity to do all of that in every circumstance. I can't even do it sometimes with the people I love, let alone the people that, well, that I don't care for very much. <laughs> I'm commanded to love them, right? So, so I have to grow in my belonging to Jesus. I have to grow in my becoming like Jesus, of being with Jesus, and doing that together with you. That's why I need these commitments and practices, because there's no way I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live that rule, to love my neighbor as myself, to do good to them, if I don't mature and grow spiritually. So that's why I need these commitments and practices. Again, this is not the rule. That's the rule. Love my neighbor as myself. Do good to them. And when somebody, there are people also that we're called to do good to that don't deserve it. They do not deserve it. Do good to them anyway. <laughs> that's the rule. But, you know, someone needs to settle the score with, with what they've done and what they haven't done. You know, well, yeah, maybe. But that's not my role, thank God. And that's not your role to balance the scale with that person. We'll leave that to God. If there's any divine retribution that's needed, God, that's God's work. <laughs> We're just supposed to do good to them. We're not trying to 
bring justice in terms of their life or correct their life or be their parent. We're just supposed to do good. Leave that to, to God. How often, anyway, am I in, I have no position to, to do that anyway, right? How often is someone maybe coming at me and they're kind of like, what's going on with this person? You know, I, I may want to kind of you know, judge them in some way. And then uh, later on, I might find out something that's happened to them recently or in their life. And I'll go, oh, suddenly I see what's happening is in a whole different light. And I feel much differently <laughs> about creating space for them because of what they've just gone through, what they've been through, right? And I don't have access to all the stuff that's going on in somebody's life. So how can I even be in a position to be able to do the, the settling of the score? And who am I anyway, you know, who has the same <laughs> issues and problems and right, deficiencies in my own life? That's, that's God's work. I don't need to figure out whether someone is deserving of good. I'm just to do good as God has done good to me. Three simple rules. I'm not meant to confuse matters here. I'm meant to clarify them. We engage in these commitments and practices so we might live the rules of loving God and loving our neighbor, of doing no harm, of doing good, of staying in love with God. Lord, increase our capacity to do good. We want to. We're called to. It's, it's, it's innate in us because we're created in your image. We want to do good to others. We want to do good in this world. We want to make a difference in this world. But so often we come up short. Forgive us, Lord, when we come up short. Cleanse us and, and, and heal us. And help us not to be discouraged, but to be encouraged. To increase our capacity. To increase our love for you. To increase our, our, practi- our spiritual practice that might enable us to grow more into the, the kind of person that we want to be. To do the kind of things that we really want to do in our best, in our heart of hearts. May your spirit stir within us and bring this about. We pray in Jesus' name. remain seated as we sing our song God, we 
gather here to you in this time of prayer, for you are the all-seeing one, you who are above us, within us, and around us. Help us to see deeply as we pray the words before us and look down upon us. Look out from within us. Look all around us so that we may learn to see through your eyes, to hear through your ears, to feel through your heart. And touch us, O Almighty One, whether for healing, comfort, joy, heartache, or wisdom. For when you reach out and lay your hand upon us, our hearts leap from the boundless grace you give. And when we are surrounded by your infinite mercy and when we feel the power of your unconditional love, then we know the questions we need to ask and the doubts we need to settle. In this time of prayer, we humbly beseech you hear all our needs, especially of those who have asked us to pray for them. For your words are healing and they bring us closer to you. As a praying people, we understand that it's through the power of your all-present spirit that we are changed for good. It's through the power of your Holy Spirit that we move towards what is good. And it's through the power of your great spirit that we are helped to do good so that we may help you transform our world for the better. We need to be changed, divine creator, to be and to act more like you. May these prayers help us see what needs changing so that when we meet you face to face, we may look upon your heavenly countenance and hear you utter, well done, good and faithful friend. So at this time of offering, we remember it is in the giving that we are blessed. And so we give with joyful and grateful hearts for we share what we have in the same spirit as to how you give it to us. Amen.
Lord, we give thanks to you for all your blessings in our lives. We give thanks for the privilege of sharing in your work in this world. Most of all, we give thanks for Jesus, who opens to us an abundant life, who offers us your life in which we share. We express our gratitude through him, and we pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. blessed with such rich texts uh, to our hymns. Really, some of these are just uh, extraordinary expressions of faith. I commend to you uh, the, the, the prayer guide uh, this week. Would you join me in prayer uh, for these things? I would commend that to you. Also, as you leave today, um, uh, Bishop Reuben Job has written a little book, many of you may know about it, called Three Simple Rules. It's, it's, it's the updated version of Wesley's general rules. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. If you want to pick one of those up as you leave, they're back there as you leave on the table. Um, they cost about $6. If you want to donate $6 to cover the cost, that's great. Uh, if you don't, that's fine. If you want to give more than $6, that's fine too, <laughs> to cover the cost. So that's just a donation, but if, sure, if you want one, please pick one up uh, as you leave. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ now and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.